Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming. Um, as you can see, I'm not the star, I'm mere cockroach today. But uh, the big star is Eric Schmidt, who, as you probably know, uh, knows about most things more than anybody else. Um, I will ask Mr. Schmidt to say whatever he wants to say. And um, I'm going to ask him a couple of questions. And then I'm going to open it to the floor as much as possible. Because there are so many of you, I urge you not to make comments and just tell me who you are. Um, and um, ask the question, and uh, Mr. Schmidt will try to answer them. And uh, if you ask an intelligent question, I'll let it through, and I'll give you a book <laughs> by Mr. Schmidt. If you ask a stupid question, you'll be put down and passed on to somebody else, because we haven't got time to waste. Okay, um, Eric, all over to you. Tell us, give us your pearls of wisdom about anything you really want I, to do. I, I actually really want to talk about you. <laughs> uh, I, I will tell you that in, in, I get to travel around the world and I've visited every day. I meet lots of interesting people. And I think David is one of the greatest, greatest living people in the world. Uh, in particular, <laughs> in particular, he's committed to an open and free exchange of ideas. And so he had the idea of this exchange and he and his wife have worked hard on all of this stuff uh, to make this possible. And I can think of no better use of our time and my time than to listen to you ask really interesting and hard questions. There is no better host in the world than you. So you don't want to say anything. Do you want me to stop? <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me ask. Uh, <laughs> so much for praise. <laughs> what do you Americans would say, oh, yeah, that's great. More, more, more. <laughs> Eric, I just saw a piece in the Huffington Post uh, about uh, a week ago where you advanced the idea that computers are now not only going to be uh, computing things which, as we all know, uh, can do calculations, permutations uh, considerably faster than our brains and so forth, but that that row of being just a mere computation uh, machine is going to change and that it would actually turn into our future advisor. Uh, I'd like you very much to expand on that proposition and let us hear why you think that is going to be the case. Having already revolutionized our lives with uh, something like Google uh, on the internet, um, why do you think that the computer is actually going to be even more important in well, the future? You know, I've been doing this for 45 years. And in that 45 years, we've gone from mainframes with these sort of very, very relatively slow to these devices, which are about a billion times faster in terms of price performance. And so you all experience computing today from a supercomputer that's in your pocket connected to a fast 4G network or a Wi-Fi network. Some countries are faster than others. Some networks are faster than others. And then a back end of cloud services. Um, and, and you all experience that as iPhone and Android apps that are interesting and powerful. And to understand how important those things are, just lose your phone, right? Spend an entire day without your phone and realize how incredibly addicted you are. And you weren't addicted five years ago because this stuff wasn't invented. You were addicted, I guess, to something else. So the question is, what happens next? And I believe that there is a transition just about to happen across all of computing where the way to understand it is that the computers use data to give smarter answers. And I'll give you some examples. So today what happens is you sit there and you use your phone and you say, you know, where am I going? And in, in this country you use Uber and you use Facebook and YouTube and Twitter and so forth and so on. Don't you really want the phone to make suggestions? Like it's going to take an hour and a half to get from outside of London and so forth, so maybe you should take the train. Or maybe the phone should call somebody and say, hey, I'm late. I mean, simple stuff, right? Daily lives. Well, that's coming, and that's coming now very, very soon. But the potential for this, and the technical aspect of this, is that there's a new set of algorithms called machine learning, where you take data and you train the data, and then it gets smarter. So an example, a good example of, of uh, machine learning is image recognition or Google Translate. Everybody here uses Translate. It doesn't use a dictionary. It's just seen over and over and over again, Chinese and American and so forth. Well, that model works for everything. So as long as you have enough data, you can begin to, you can begin to ask 
predictive questions, modeling questions. Uh, in my case, what would I like? And maybe this will be possible. I'd like my phone to do a pretty good job of being an assistant and say, Eric, you really don't like Italian food, and the last time you were there, you got sick, so don't go to that restaurant. Right? That would be very useful. Right? And that kind of information is now becoming possible. Well, you, I, I, don't, I, I want to maximize uh, uh, the audience being able to ask uh, uh, Eric questions. So let's have an intelligent question. Okay. All right. You're very keen. Can hello, Luke. Wake up. <laughs> you, you've got to bring these mics around quickly. Otherwise, we're going to lose time. Go on quickly. And the second one, right? This lady here with a dotted. Yeah. So two for, and, and this one third. Okay. Ask question. No. One, one minute. Three at a time. Okay. Hello, Roscoe, Rocky. Why is the speaker not working? Say it again. Should just be one AI, or do you believe in a crossover and perhaps a group of AIs, like a kind of trend, like a conscious being, it's like we all are here. We're not one object, one uh, hive. We are separate AIs in our own right, and perhaps there will be different types of AI and technology that will be able to better humanity in the future. Thank you. So, um, Rocky? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know that you like the yellow mic, but this is probably better. Let me just take it off. Otherwise. <laughs> there is no better host than David. <laughs> you don't get to undress, Eric, too often. <laughs> That's the prerogative of women, not men. Um, so, so in order for the vision that you're describing to occur, a lot of things have to get invented and a lot of things happen to hap have to happen in order. And it might happen, it might not. This is why I think of it more as a science fiction question, and we can speculate lots of ways. What we know is that machine learning will be very good at helping us do things that are routine. So typical examples, computers can look through photographs and find the one photograph that's different from a million. You can't do this as a human. But it's a, it's a serious it's a serious leap to begin to say, can computers begin to ask questions? They're very good at answering, answering questions, but can they ask them? And we don't know. Um, if we will know, it will be a long time from now. So. OK, that's it. You're going to have a book <laughs> and shut up. <laughs> Next question. Uh, I know there's the, there's the one with the, yes, you. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, my name is Hai Meng from Phoenix Satellite, uh, Chinese Television. My question is that um, how do you see the Google operation in China? And for example, we're having difficulty using Gmail in China. Yeah, but look, listen, listen, one minute, okay? Let's talk about technology and not China because there is, um, there is uh, there's a whole host of questions. It's too complicated for this forum. I'll give you a book. You can shut up. The girl is this China a, exchange, a, by the way? Yes, I know. Exchange being the emphasis, right? Polka dot woman. Nope. <laughs> let's get the moving going. Let's get the whole thing going. Come worthy. on, let's go. The next, next uh, 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 speaker there, and one yes, aspect. Uh, hi, my name is Anastasia. I'm a digital coach. Um, I help people balance their online behavior. So, Excellent. Um, the question to you um, you're describing the future of uh, symbiosis of people and tech, very optimistic. What I'm seeing is that people are getting increasingly overwhelmed by all the digital communication. So do you have any plans to address that in Google? And what is your digital routine? How do you not get overwhelmed? Well, Thank you. I'd, I'd like to remind everybody in the audience that there is a very important feature of every phone, which is that it has an off button. Okay. <laughs> so in my addiction to this, I have developed a capability of turning the phone off <laughs> for 90 minutes over dinner. 
Now this is causing me to be sort of nervous, right? And I haven't been able to do this over breakfast or lunch. That's, that's where I am. But I, I think from, a, from Google's perspective, our job is to get this information out there. And I think people are very curious. People have a lot to learn. They enjoy themselves. Uh, go in an elevator and watch people now. And in an elevator, they're all online. What are they doing? They're doing work. They're doing Instagram. They're doing you know, whatever. Right? I don't see this as bad. But I think everybody has to find their limit. Um, one of the more interesting things is that young people now are online while they're awake, and if they wake up while they're sleeping, they turn on their device and turn it back off. All right, good question and good answer. Uh, a book, right? Yes, you with a bald head. Uh, yeah. My name is Marin. I'm from yeah. I'm from Startup Grinds. Uh, we are part of Google for Entrepreneurs. My question is uh, concerning singularity. So machine learning is great. Uh, in recent months, we've heard people like Elon Musk. Uh, uh, we heard people like uh, Bill Gates uh, raise uh, their voices around uh, being, uh, being nervous, around uh, machines being more intelligent than we, we would be. How nervous are you about this, this issue? Um, I, I am not. And, um, and again, with respect to the earlier question, it's a similar answer. And, and the, the negative fears go something like this. Um, in order for something really bad to happen, we would have to not be watching and we have control over the power system for these computers. So I find these fears, um, they're science fiction fears at this point. Uh, I'm much more interested in what this ability to do human assistance makes us smarter. And if humans are smarter, right, we make more money, we have fewer wars, we're better educated, right? Um, David and I were talking about this. In, in the next 30 years, a couple billion people will be joining the middle class from abject poverty. These are great stories, right? The empowerment of humans around the world. Think of the, here we are in the China exchange. Think of the story of modern China and the growth from a very, very poor country to the, power, the, the powerful country that she is today. These are wonderful things. These are not bad things. Good, good question. Um, I put for the man with the very little hair. <laughs> All right, you with more hair and a beard. Hi, Maury Schenk, I'm an investor. Um, in search, Google has sort of naturally come to a lead position. In machine learning, it's less obvious if you're getting advice from lots of different places that people will want it from one dominant source like that. How do you see that for Google? Well, first of all, we never use the word dominant. Um, so I didn't understand your latter question. There is a race at the moment in the industry to hire a set of computer scientists who've invented all of this. That race includes Google, Apple, Facebook, a number of other companies. So we're all competing for the best minds and the best algorithms. So what, what do you mean in the sense that it's not as? Well, recommendations come in a lot of different areas. I'm invested in a science recommendation engine, restaurants, yeah. you know, uh, uh, hotels. And it's not as obvious you'll just go right. to Google for all these things. But you that's, but go that's, to a specialist. I, I see. But that's good, because that means everybody is getting into this game of making the system smarter. When you go to a site and it doesn't give you some recommendation, doesn't give you some help, you think it's not a very smart site. I think that's all good. More investment in that area is good for everybody. Uh, along that line, let me ask, just ask the question. I mean, up till now, we have deferred in every sector that I can think of, so-called expert opinion. So when we read a newspaper, we would like to read a, a, a editorial or certain writers. Huffington Post was born out of the proposition that you actually don't need famous writers or writers that you respect, but that you want to hear to your, uh, to your, your peers what they say, what everybody says. And would it not be the case that in future, with this computation giving advice or being made to search a lot more things and data, and from that data building up suggestions and so forth, would that also mean that in time, those so-called experts who now uh, go on uh, the, the site uh, asking people to join them because they can give advice would gradually disappear because, you know, within three seconds, the computer will be able to tell you in the last week what dress was, has sold most, and that's what people want. They, they want to know the most popular dress being sold, the most popular film being shown, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Are we going through an egalitarian? Um... Well, you have pointed out that computers are very good at counting the most popular things, but computers are not very good at predicting what will be popular. 
That's where curation or humans or judgment or so forth is likely to, to work. And all of the attempts to use computers to predict things have relied on finding the experts and adding up all their votes. So computers are very good at counting, but they're not so good at predicting future things where there's no data to predict it. Right? And one of the great things about being human is that the people create new things, both good and bad. There are new crises. We, we, we can never predict exactly what's going to be hot, what's going to be, what's going to fail. And the science of this is, this is why Hollywood is always something, something of, a, of a randomization event. So I worry about the social media aspects affecting the political process. Because we have a political process which is ultimately consensus based. And now there are so many other sources of information, it's hard for politicians to know how to get their message across, et cetera. I think it's an unknown experiment at the moment. But isn't it the case that politicians now rely a great deal on what they read in the press or what they regard as being well, the drift? I, I won't speak for Britain. You guys can comment about your own election. But in the United States, um, there's a cycle where the, it's, it's very short term now. And part of that is because we can measure it and we can figure out that people really care about this particular issue and then we can measure it and then the politicians go after that. And I'm not sure that's a good thing. The answer to all of these concerns, right, aside from having an off button that you can turn off for 90 minutes at dinner, um, is education. Right? That we, we are not slaves of the specific mouthpiece of any particular site or any particular message. Each of us is critical and critical thinking is key. That's why we go to high school. That's why we go to college. That's why that the educational system, which was pioneered here in this country, is so incredibly important. When the 90 minutes is up and you have a very scintillating companion in front of you, do you still switch on your phone? Of course. <laughs> well, there it is. What for you? Uh, right, that lady over there. OK, thank you very much. And then much. the man next door. Thank you. Uh, um, because uh, Eric just mentioned about uh, what you were about, uh, about uh, uh, let's just make it simple. Could you please describe in five or ten years how human life could be since in the past five or ten years and um, technology and the internet has so fundamentally changed our way of living? So the, the first thing to say is that the biggest story is not here. The biggest story is that because of all of the globalization connectivity in, five, in maybe ten years, it's on the order of another half a billion to a billion people will move into middle class. That has huge implications for cities and infrastructures and pollution and so forth. And most of these countries are in Asia. Right? So that's sort of number one. Number two is that we're on the cusp of major developments in biology, genetics, and health. Uh, the average life expectancy around the world now is about 71 and a half. That's amazing. Poverty rates have been cut in half. And we're close, for example, to having a full map of cancer and its genetic components. So with that, we can begin to solve some of the very, very hard medical problems. So I like that, that area. We're beginning to understand the modeling of the brain, for example. Uh, another area that's interesting is energy. Uh, we're all very concerned about climate change. Climate change is very, very real. And there are now significant improvements in renewable energies that will allow us to do that. So I foresee a much safer, much more efficient, much more globalized world. And there are certainly issues of it, but I see it as much, much better. Everything you do will be far smarter because of the, all the tools and techniques. You'll just be, think about how much more you know now than you did 10 years ago before you started using Google. Right? That just the amount of day-to-day -day knowledge you have of both important things and unimportant things. Well, we certainly know your face a lot more. Thank you. Um, all right, I'm going to give one each. Now, be careful. I'm yeah. giving you a book in Thank advance. Thank you very much. But Thank you very much. Don't give it to him yet. <laughs> OK, OK. Ask the uh, question. My name is Ryan. Uh, I come from a Chinese translation company. We localized uh, Google SketchUp a few years ago into you. Chinese, simplified. Uh, my question is, I saw two phones on your table. Oh, do you use iPhone or a Google phone? Which I, are my <laughs> primary phone is an Android phone, and I, use an I, and I have an iPhone in order yeah. to compare. Okay. And <laughs> All right. All right you, earn your, you earn a good observation. And there is a man over there who has been on the, you, on the, looking at your phone I all the time. The yes, exactly. Can I ask a question? Uh, now, wait, wait one minute. So what have you been looking at just now? Making notes. And by oh, the way, by the way, close. you know what's funny. What's funny about it is that people used to use computers and type, yeah. and now it's normal for you to do exactly what you're doing. And if you're using an Android phone, you'd have a larger screen. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> one minute. All right, one over there, and then I'm going to by the way, can be we biased give, over can we this. Can give time. the gentleman with notes a book? Uh, no, because we're, <laughs> we're, it's archaic. Um, yes, you. Me, right? Okay. Um, I'm Selena. I'm from Hong Kong. 
Um, we, we heard a lot of questions about technology and society today, but my question is about you. So you are just saying that you've been in this space for 45 years and together with the organizations such as Google and Apple, you constantly innovate. So you think about new things and you're being visionary about it. So I'm very curious to understand how do you practically do that? Do you have any tips, say, do you yeah. put aside time to think? Are you just simply an innovative person or how do we really well, keep for, that Well, first place, I, I get to take credit for the work that other people did. Of course, of course. Um, so I want what to be sure. What do you mean, sure. of course? <laughs> <laughs> Sit down. We're no very more humble, questions. very humble. You can't, <laughs> no book, and you can't ask <laughs> Eric how can successful I, can he can is. I, can I, let me answer her question. So, how dare so, you. So, so, so part of the way we work is we try to figure out what problems are really big in the world, and then we try to say, is there a new solution? I'll give you an example that in America, there's a problem of diabetes, and people have to test themselves for glucose. So one of our engineering groups figured out a way to make a contact lens with the world's smallest battery that shows you your glucose state so you don't have to prick your finger. This affects, you know, will affect on the order of hundreds of millions of people, and especially in America where there's this sort of fatness problem. Uh, and it's going to be very, very serious. So we love doing those kinds of things. Another one is a driverless car. Um, most of you got here in a car that was driven by a human, right? I've been in the cars without, without humans in them, and, except for me, uh, <laughs> and, except for me. And it's quite something. But eventually, the idea was you'll have fewer deaths, right? There are 1.2 million people killed in car accidents in the world every year. In America, there are 31,000, which is considered a low number. Every one of those deaths is a family, a child, a relative, a parent, and so forth. If we could cut that in half, or cut that by a factor of four, that's a huge contribution. That's why we do this. Excellent answer, but not to your question. <laughs> right, okay, on the right-hand side, we've got to go. Right, go on, quick. Hello, sir. My name is Song. I'm a PhD student How old in are you? My question is, uh, as How you said... How old are you? Uh, I'm 28, sorry. Okay, good, um, all right. Sorry, uh, <laughs> If you're as underage, you I've got to put, <laughs> sit you down. Yeah. This is an adult audience. <laughs> as you said just now, the uh, technology become more uh, safer and smarter, and uh, we've seen a lot of films show, show that the AI become more self-control and uh, improvement and revolution something. Do you really think these things are going to happen in the future? Well, my own opinion is that the computers will get really, really good at doing what they're good at, and humans will be really good at what we're good at. What are we good at? Curation, creativity, caring, asking questions. What are computers doing at? Things that are boring. They remember everything. They have good searches. They can answer questions that you give them. And that separation is what I think will really happen. I think the other questions are more speculation. Could you eventually have an artificial intelligence? Could it be like you could talk like a human? We don't know. Those are a long time from now. Maybe in my lifetime, maybe not, but a long time. All right, good question. 28 euro, here it is. <laughs> okay, you, and then back to, to the lady. Go on. Yeah. Uh, hi, I'm Zhong Han. I'm a PhD student in transport. So uh, the first question is about the driverless car. So how do you propose, you have tested someone, but how do you propose to provide it to the public, there is legislation problem. And the second one is... No, no sit down. Uh, one is enough. Driverless cars. How do you... <laughs> I don't know. So, I mean, are you in the business of so, inventing so, driverless so cars? Our, so, our, so our cars have a, a laser on top of them, and they have a computer in the back, and the laser looks around better than the human eye, and the computer in the back does the calculation and says what to do. So an example is that uh, I was literally in the car, and it's driving along, and there I see the, the worst possible scenario, a woman and a child, and the child is holding the hand, and the child runs off into the street, you know, the mother having lost the child, and the car stops, and I go, ah. right? How did it know that? Because it had been trained over and over again that anything gets in front of it, just stop, and it stops very quickly. So I think it's going to work really well. Uh, we have to find areas which in, in America that will allow us to test, there have been discussions about trying to test it in Europe as well. But I think ultimately this technology will be ready in some years, not in decades. It's very soon. I mean, there's always a problem of liabilities as well. Yeah, there's a whole bunch of questions. So the best example is sometimes, I, I, maybe in Britain, everyone drives at the speed limit uh, because of all the, 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 the traffic cameras. Um, and I don't know about Hong Kong, David, but you can speak about that. But in, in America, people often speed because everyone else is going the same speed. 
how could a driverless car go faster than the speed limit? And if it gets a ticket, who pays for it? We have to figure those questions out. Figure that one out. Okay, the lady with the ginger hair, yes. Hi, I'm Lizzie. Um, I'm a doctor, and I've been following your developments in health uh, for some years. Particularly sad to see Google Health Co, but really interested about Calico. What do you see Google or technology's involvement in healthcare um, over the next few years? I think it's going to be large. Um, Calico is a research fund to talk about the origins and basics of disease. So it's really think of that as research. Um, somewhere between three and five percent of our queries are health related. So we worked hard to get health professionals to give us the right answers and surface those. Because people really are using Google for, for health things. But the more interesting question is what happens when you have big data and you have machine learning and you have all these? I'll give you an example. Hospitals don't have a single database of everything that they can search. And there's a, there was a discussion here in Britain about the National Health Service has such databases, but they're not unified. So if you were to allow those databases to be unified, you could begin to have computers go through them and figure out the causes of diseases that do doctors like yourself won't see. Right? There's just too many, medicine is too complicated for any brilliant person to keep it all in her head. Uh, and that's, that promise will mean far better diagnosis very quickly if we can get the data. Okay, good. I like to give a book to a proper professional, a doctor. Right, and, and yes, you're right. Okay, don't worry. You you are the driverless car, the, the man with a huge Adam apple. Yeah. <laughs> right, okay, who's next? Right, okay, good. Big Hello, smile. I'm Sophia. I'm wondering, can I have a book first? <laughs> <laughs> no, you can't. Sit down. <laughs> no, you haven't asked the question yet. Oh, I haven't, but yeah, okay. Um, the reason I was asking for a book because my question is not really related to technology. Well, then sit down. Okay, next question. All right, you with the glasses. You look intelligent. You look like a professional. But turn your collar down. Your collar's up. Yeah. Show, rush, show some respect. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my name is Darwe Hu, Hogan Lovells International. I'm a computer scientist and a lawyer. Um, question is that uh, we, there are obviously a huge amount of incredible developments on the horizon. What do you see as Stop being, mumbling. Ask the question. What do you see as be, being the biggest obstacles to those developments? Thank you. So which, which particular ones in computer science, since you're a computer scientist? Um, I'm particularly interested in the, kind of, um, the general evolution of the, what the article David was uh, mentioning uh, in relation to the role of the computers changing from personal assistants to advisors. <clears throat> I think there's a series of questions. One is we don't know what countries will do with this powerful things. Um, some countries have more concern about privacy, some countries have more concern about security. That's an example. I'm always worried that the internet is going to be shut down, that, the, that uh, for example, there's threats in Russia to make the Russian internet much less open. So all of these successes depend on an open and free internet, an open and free exchange of ideas, and I worry about those kinds of things. Um, ultimately, I think we're going to have a whole body of law, since you're a lawyer, around the rights of, of individuals in these situations. I wrote a book on this called The New Digital Age, which um, Sir David actually interviewed me for. Right, as I haven't got that here, I won't give it to you, and your question was too general, so I'm not gonna give you this one either. All right, the woman <laughs> at the back, yes. Hi, my name is Maria from Big Couch, and my question is, the people are really excited about um, the future intelli artificial intelligent assistance, but at the same time, they are concerned with uh, their information being shared with third parties. So my question is, how do you plan to address the privacy aspect, data collection and analysis, and not uh, make people feel comfortable with sharing information with these assistants? Thank you. So what I found is that most people worry about information that they put on their phones and on the internet because they're afraid it'll be stolen or misused or misused by the government. And there have been a number of high profile cases where people have stolen pictures, stolen information, and it's been hurtful to, to people. So that's obviously criminal, and it's illegal, it's not good, and so forth. So we have, to, we have to do a series of things. First, we have to make sure the laws make sure that that stuff remains illegal. The technology exists to keep your information very private. And so I, I view this as not a technological problem, but rather a systemic problem. And there are many cases where the governments and people are not in agreement. In America, for example, there's a huge fight over what is called the Section 215 Act, which is the, the law that allowed the, national, uh, the NSA to do spying on domestic citizens or not. 
It was recently found to be illegal, and now the Congress may or may not reenact it. So those kinds of things in our, in our first book, Jared and I say, each country will go through its own process to answer that. And I worry that we'll end up with a different answer in every country. It would be very complicated for us, but we'll get through it. All right. Who has the microphone? Yeah, you, for God's sake. <laughs> Pass it on to somebody. Right. Uh, all right. That, yeah, that man with a gray T-shirt. He looks like a bit of a geek. <laughs> oh. Hi, I'm, uh, I'm Darren. I'm a developer. What do you see you as the right. role? He is a developer. Good oh, job. Yeah. I am. <laughs> you wonder how, how he became so famous. <laughs> Clever guy. Um, what do you see as the role of technology in teachers in the classroom um, and their supporting role of each other? The teachers are incredibly important. When I think about the impact on me, it was the teachers that had as much impact as my family um, in, in sort of turning me into a sort of a proper adult. And the difference now is we can measure what works. So using machine learning, we can actually look at whether it's better to sit in a seat all day or whether it's to have it broken up. There's some evidence, for example, that people learn better if they learn in 10-minute segments and then they take a break and have a conversation, and then another 10 minutes and they take a break and have a conversation. The important thing is that all of education has based, been done based on intuition and local opinion. So in America, we went from the old math to the new math back to the old math because people couldn't agree. Right, as opposed to figuring out. So now we can actually answer the question whether the old math is better than the new math. And I assume the same things have happened here. One of the things that's important about the UK is that for many years, computer science was treated as a trade and not at the same level as physics and math. And a few years ago, uh, in the first uh, administration of David Cameron, uh, the education minister actually made a change that made computer science be equal. And that's important from the standpoint of future leadership here in, Amer here in uh, Britain. Yeah, the, 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 at the back, the, the man with a red jumper. All right, well, yeah, yeah okay, you, you ask first, the, the and then... Lady, the lady in the back has a mic. Which one? All right, okay, who is the lady at the back? No, 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 she is working for me. No, but she could give that mic to yeah, someone. Yeah, give that mic to somebody who... Hands <laughs> for God's sake. <laughs> All right, you. Yeah. In the Hello. lumber. Uh, Cohen What's from uh, Hyper Island. Uh, I have a question. Um, I'm from Belgium, and we have a lot of problems with legislation in Belgium. There is, uh, we don't know what to do with Uber, we don't know what to do with Airbnb. We keep having problems with innovation, basically. Yeah, I, I have an opinion on those. <laughs> I would really love to hear your opinion, because I see that a lot of governments are struggling with it. Do you see it as something that, we will, that will be finished in, in a year or two years, or is this going to be an ongoing problem? Well, let's talk a little bit about how economics, economies grow. You always have invention. you know. New chemicals, new manufacturing, new buildings, new cars, new software, new ideas, new art, right? That is inevitably built in the private sector. You have to allow economies to be competitive. You have to allow new entrants. So in Uber's case in particular, they have to be able to enter the country with appropriate re restrictions and so forth. But if you block them completely, right, it's true of Airbnb as well, with appropriate restrictions, you need to allow the competition to occur. If you look in the politics in all of these countries, which includes in America, the politics are always a local group fighting very hard to protect their jobs, which I understand. But the fact of the matter is society is better off with that competition. So I would argue, you using Brussels, but I make the general point, we are better off allowing entrepreneurs to enter new markets with new solutions and deal with the economic and, and job dislocation cost of that. It's always been true. It's not a new Yeah, Belgium, that's the, that's the worst country. Uh, I mean, that's the center of the EU. Look, look what mess that has got. Yeah. All right, the, the man with the beard, yeah, at the back, um, with the red. All right, you, you go first. Yeah, okay, uh, Anish, um, I'm an entrepreneur. I wanted to ask a question about the, um, the secret source for Google. Like, I've come across moonshot thinking, which is like you've got a section of um, Google which is aiming at like 10x above anyone else and um, just you know what advice would you give to entrepreneurs? So what we we created this group called Google X and the idea was to look right at the problems that were that affected a lot of people yeah, right. and where we could make an improvement that was a factor of 10 but we could make it in less than a decade right so there are many many problems that affect a lot of people that we don't know how to solve in the next decade so that turns out to be a very good filter. So think about, uh, go through all the problems in the world. 
political unrest, education, water, food distribution, governance, transportation. Start making a list of all that and start thinking what are areas where if a new technological solution came along that it would materially make things faster. Now, for example, let's imagine that, that we had some idea that made, made airplanes fly 10 times faster, which we don't, by the way. Then we would immediately go on that because it affects so many people. We haven't quite figured out how to do the economics of that. But what did happen is we had an idea to do this balloon. And the idea was that you'd have these balloons that would fly around the, the world, and they would provide L LTE service in remote areas that will never get wireless connectivity. I thought it would never work. I was quite convinced that this balloon idea was yet another harebrained, foolish idea from within the company. They launched the balloons, and it worked. They worked because they knew how to use altitude to figure out how to move themselves. They go up and down to change direction. It never occurred to me. Over and over again, that's yeah. how you do it. Well, I like to know how I can accelerate my profit annually by 10 times. <laughs> OK, uh, next, next question. Uh, yeah, I, I promised them that three times already. The man with the, with the red jumper. Hello, I'm Philip. I'm PhD in solar energy, and I'd like to know what do you want to be leaders in? You're doing so many things. Well, Google doesn't think of it that way. Google thinks of it in terms of what are interesting problems. So, for example, in renewable energy, we, in re renewable energy, we actually had a series of engineering teams looking at solar, geothermal, wind power. We ultimately decided that the best use of Google was to invest in those, but not invent them ourselves. So we're not building solar panels, right? Other people do that. But we are one of the largest funders of renewable energy from our cash perspective, which we view as good in the world. Um, so, so, so we see the problem and we try to figure out how to best attack it. We don't view it as a, sort of in, in the normal business way. We say, here's an interesting problem. If we can solve this, we can make money somehow. Okay. I think we, we, we'll start with the middle group, which seems to be, yeah. Okay, go on. You, okay. Okay. Hi, I'm Chris. I'm, amongst other things, I'm a, I'm a father, and I guess, as many of the other people here are in the room, you touched on it earlier, and to pick up my developer gig friend's uh, comments about education, the opportunities presented by AI and automation are vast, are enormous, but the potential implications on what skills people need um, in an economy to actually work and be successful, um, there's a knock-on effect there as well. Um, I'm intrigued not just by the opportunity to use technology better in classrooms, but also how we empower teachers um, and indeed parents to foster the kind of creativity, collaboration, the thing to set humans apart from machines. I'm just interested in your opinions on that. So, so the, I'm a, a member of the board of the Khan Academy, and the Khan Academy is trying to invert the classroom. And the idea is that the student would go home and watch videos at home, and when they went to the classroom with the teacher, they would engage in very sophisticated gaming, you know, where they would learn by collaboration. And there's a great deal of evidence that what Khan, what Saul Khan has invented works better for high school students and, and basically, you know, uh, elementary school students. So there's an example. But my view is that we should have hundreds of groups doing that, not just one, right? That with modern measurement, we can try every lame-brained theory. You have your idea, I have my idea, we can measure them for the first time in history. And, and if you think forward and you imagine the world I'm describing, the only solution is education. And when I say education, I mean relevant education for critical thinking, understanding how to work all these things, learning how to search. Um, when I was in, I grew up in Virginia, and as a 12-year-old, they made me memorize the 50 counties that are part of the state of Virginia. And by the way, I was quite good at it. Now, why in the world is that a useful thing? Were they just punishing me? I hadn't done anything wrong. It's not something I would ever use again. I don't live in Virginia now, and I can look it up. Right? And I bet you there's still teachers doing that. So again, the educational system changes slowly, and it needs to respond to your point very well. Yes, all right. Over there, and then over here. The, the, yes, the man for the... For the Hi, uh, my name is Alexander and I work in finance. My question is about uh, information neutrality, uh, with net neutrality being hotly contested. He with the most money determines you know, who gets access. Who do you think is going to look after that in the future when your phone encourages you to buy a Big Mac or go to this restaurant? And that may not necessarily be 
a neutral suggestion. Yeah, I understand your question. That's a very good question. Um, very good. You can have two. <laughs> <laughs> that, now first, listen, that's the kind I, of intelligent question we want. That's the first want. time I've gotten that question. Um, so my answer to essentially all of these net, net neutrality questions, information net neutrality, is more competition. So as long as there's enough competitors, then one competitor can't steer you just to his or her restaurants or his or her television stations or so forth. So I only would like to see regulation in those markets if there's a market failure. In other words, if there's not enough competition. And the regulation I'd like to see promotes more competition. These markets change so quickly that if you, let's say we write down a rule. And the rule we write is that the iPhone guys cannot favor their own restaurants. And you write that down and it takes years and you pass the law and so forth. Well, in the meantime, the iPhone guys will have changed their application in some way that the, re the law isn't really that relevant. It'll have changed again. So you're much better off saying, we want a, a brutal, tough, competitive environment, which is globalized. One more. That drives prices down, and it keeps everybody honest. Sorry. One more, for God's sake. Four? Yes. Yes. He's got two. We're giving him two. I, I already Wait. gave. You got, you got one or yeah. two? I Two, right, okay, sit down. <laughs> right, no more. Right, uh, the man with a, with a beard, yeah, uh, with, a, with a moustache. No, no, hold, yeah, the microphone first. Hello, my name is Wyman and I'm a Google user. Um, following up on the last question about... You're a what? A geezer? A Google user. A Google user. Yeah. By the way, is there, here, is, there we all here, is, there, is there anyone here who is not a Google user? Hands up, raise your hands. Not, okay, well, who is not a Google, Google user? Google .com. Okay. Yeah, and leave immediately. So my question uh, relates <laughs> Call a little police. bit to the, to the last questioner in terms of competition, but also on the substrate or inputs into the Google model, um, and it relates to data. Do you think that data can be owned, and should it be owned? You know, the explosion of data is so large that I don't worry about any single source of information controlling it. I don't worry about Google controlling it. I don't worry about our competitors controlling it. I don't worry about governments. We're producing information at such a fast rate, especially the current stuff, that the problem is the inverse, which is that all the business models that involve controlling information are in challenge because there's so much of it. So I don't worry. There are too many people who have smartphones to channel any particular area. You know, if you did something wrong, too many people in this, on smartphones would notice it even if you prevented, tried to prevent them from doing that. I mean, that's, that's the problem governments have, is uh, that citizens now have smartphones and they're capable of keeping their governments honest. Yes. Hi. Um, we were talking about who's not a Google user, who's not a Google product, because I feel sometimes that I'm a product of Google in many ways, although I'm not that young to look like a... <laughs> um, I mean, really, doing research can move you from being a layperson onto knowing a lot more. But as you said about intuitive uh, search, how about having a stage when people, before they push this publish button and they generate information to which you search afterwards, isn't it possible to have a form that they self-describe what is their field, what their information, where their keywords are? I know there are many ways, and we all try CEO, et cetera, but I mean, we it's have, really... We have tried that, and, and our view is any form of information you want to publish, we're happy to present uh, through Google. We're not trying to... We're, we're not trying to sort of guide it one way or the other. I do understand it would be better, but we've taken an agnostic view to how the information gets done. As long as it's out there, we want to get it. We believe in information and we believe in all of it, the good and the bad. Hi, um, my question's to do with exploitation. So as you've spoken very eloquently about uh, greater access to things, good things, actually there's been a greater access to quite negative things, such as an increase of porn, of prostitution, uh, and, and sex trafficking. Um, and which is direct consequence of the internet. Um, how does Google see its position in dealing with those issues, uh, working with governments or independently? So I'm not sure I completely agree that the increase in sex tracking is due to the internet. It may be a substitution effect. Um, I would guess that there's been an increase in porn because of the free sites. I don't, we've not really measured that. So I think we would want to, to give you a proper answer, we'd have to look at the numbers. On the, on the sexual trafficking and other kind of trafficking, Google has a large program to study that, to actually study the networks. And then it turns out, I didn't know this, that the, the illicit networks that, that govern guns and arms and bad things, drugs, 
are very, very large, and we can track them much better. Um, an example is that there is a National Center for Exploited Children, which is now global, which can actually now identify where kids have been kidnapped and try to recover them. So the tools work against evil pretty well, right? Because evil people have trouble um, keeping up their, you know, uh, hiding their tracks. And so with a little bit of work, we can typically find the bad things. So be careful. <laughs> right, you. <Yeah. laughs> Hello, Gavin McNichol from Dividable, which is a, uh, does automated bill payments for households. Google has a great deal of experience working in the payments industry, and there's a huge number of fintech startups now. What are your top three tips for value creation in the fintech space? Well, first place, I think there's going to be a very, very large amount of wealth created here in Britain in financial technology. There's a lot of reasons to think it will work well in Britain. You have the, you have the city. You have a very sophisticated users here in the country very high advertising rates. There's all sorts of reasons. There's a lot of money that can be made by these, by these services. Um, you're also pioneers in this country with things like food delivery and gro grocery delivery, things which are, you're ahead of America, which is great. So, so I think it's there. The specifics, I think, have to do with making it easy. What happens is with the, the, most of these ideas don't survive the test of my mother. So my mother is perfectly capable of using dollars to purchase whatever it is she knows she wants to purchase. Most of these systems have one or two extra steps that confuse her. Right? And until you can answer the mom question, you're not really going to get to scale. You're going to be specialized. How about wives? <laughs> I'll let you comment. <laughs> All right. I, I know that you have been put. Let, let's, let's ask him and then you, the girl with the, with the, the, with the glasses. Go on. Hi, uh, Jeff Leong. Um, I recently have um, been told to look at this interesting, which is the google.com slash flights, which enable you to look at, f uh, look at flights across sure. different parts of the country. I was really intrigued because of the amount of data we pulled in to give users where to go, where to go, et cetera, and the best price. And in terms of reflecting on the similar along these lines of what the new ideas you're planning to do, of course, the hot topic of election, how it would be interesting for you to look at slash election and see, well, how would this party do for you and due to your circumstances, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, that's a very interesting development. I thought if there's any other future notes you're planning to do and so, so along those lines. We, so there's a line that we don't want to cross, and I understand your question. So with flights, for example, we can organize all the flights. We can answer your question. When you ask a question, what will a politician do, it's very hard for the politician to predict what they're doing, let alone what, us predicting what they're going to do. So we've decided to record what's going on, but not to speculate. So we have a very good election site, but as you saw in your election last week, all of the predictions were wrong, right? The votes were different. You had all sorts of, it's very difficult to predict these things if you're a computer. Okay, um, right, okay, the girl, yes. Uh, you spoke about London being an international financial center, leading to a lot of fintech startups. Um, what are some other natural competitive advantages you think London has that can make it a tech hub to rival Silicon Valley? Well, um, so, so if you look at, at global venture capital, some, the numbers are roughly 70% of the venture capital goes into California, the Bay Area. And the other sites are far smaller. Point one. Point two is that you, you have to have a lot of people and a lot of great universities to have enough of the selection pressure to produce these. And I think it's, most people agree that London, having Oxford and Cambridge nearby, plus the fact that many people from the continent are choosing to move here because the laws are, are easier on startups, if you will, than they are in, in continent countries. Um, the, the combination of all that means that I think London has hit a critical mass. You also have a set of companies that have gone public at billion pound valuations. So you have greed, venture capital, money, smart people, lots of people, lots of pressure. Right? So I think all of that works. I'm assuming that the majority of these things, at least initially, will be in the services of one kind or another. So, you know, Br British services of one kind. And you saw this with some of the food delivery companies, as an example. And then it'll go from there. Yes, I'm a civil engineer working for the American construction company. Um, in your opinion, what's the main difference between a Yahoo and a Google? Um. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
they're, they're run very differently. Go uh, Yahoo, started, uh, Yahoo started as a sort of bulletin board site of information, a portal, whereas Google started as sort of a ranking search engine. So they feel different. Um, but I don't really use y Yahoo, so I'm going to have to ask people to, to comment on Yahoo. <laughs> Who uses Yahoo? Hands up. What? Leave the building now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you, you've got a mic. Yeah, um, yeah, so I'm Nick. I'm from a coding school in London called Stair. Um, one of the things we're trying Just to do is... Just let me ask you, when yeah. you use y Yahoo and Google, what, how do you feel the difference? Um, I was kidding when I said I use Yahoo. I don't. I own any of Google. <laughs> <laughs> right, for but being a liar, pass on. You you've lost your question. Uh, over there. <laughs> <laughs> over there. No, this is no, no, this genuinely important question. A, a genuinely important question I want to ask you. Um, so, uh, one of the big things we're trying to address is the gender imbalance within coding. Um, in the UK now, roughly 95% of all developers are men, yes. um, and only 5% are women. I'm assuming it's a similar yeah. situation in the US. And if uh, one of the questions we always try and ask is if coding is the language of the future, how are companies like Google getting women involved in the conversation? So, so we have a lot of programs in this area. The, the numbers in the US are roughly 13% are female and roughly 80%, 87% are male. There are many possible reasons why this difference exists, but there are many other scientific endeavors where the balance is 50-50. I'll give you an example of biology. Some of the greatest biologists are, are female, very tough, very analytical. Uh, look, in medicine, in law, again, in America, and I would assume here uh, a majority are now female. So there's every reason to believe that, there, that this is some kind of funny bias that exists in the society, uh, and we don't really know why. So in our case, we are doing outreach, we're funding girls, girls Who Code programs, we're trying to make it sort of sexy and fun to be, to be a coder and so forth. Um, we've not made that much progress, and we're working hard at it. So I would tell you that it's much harder than it sounds to make this as a societal thing. Okay, now we've got only three minutes left, so we're going to take the last three questions. You can't ask because you've already asked a question, right? And you nearly got busted for being a liar. All right, okay, you. <laughs> Third, Hi. last question. Hi there, just a quick question. I'm a big Google fan, but I just wanted to know at, at what point does Google become a monopoly because it touches so many points of people's lives? Obviously, Microsoft had a big antitrust issue uh, 10 or so years ago. Um. I think the answer is clearly never. And if you look at the success of, for example, Facebook and the growth of Instagram, you should ask the different question, which is, look at the success of all these new ways in which information, how will Google respond to that? This market is so dynamic and so different that I think all of these arguments, are, they're just looking backward. Right? It's changing so fast. The apps world, the new platforms, uh, I, w I, I just don't think it's going to happen at all. OK. All right, uh, over there, yeah. Hi, Second my name is Chung Queen Lee, AKA Lee, the director of Creot, we in the architecture industry. The my question today bar? is, uh, there are so many uh, high quality learning resources online. So do we need to go to school in the near future? Yes. What do you see? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. And, and I'll tell you why. The, 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 the role of the teacher, and then especially the role of the residential college, these have been around for a very long time. Humans are not just computers. Humans are not just analytical, Spock-like beings. Humans are emotional. They need to be led. Charisma matters. Now, it may eventually be possible, you know, maybe in my lifetime, maybe after I'm dead, to have computers that have charisma and they can inspire people. But at the moment, you really need a strong teacher, and teachers are incredibly valuable. All right, the last question, I'm afraid, unless is a stupid one. Good afternoon. Thank you for the last question. A uh, very simple one. Uh, I heard the comment that a good way to understand people nowadays is to track what they actually search on Google engine. So what, is, what do you normally search or most frequently use Google search engine for? Thank you. Well, in the first place, I'm not sure I agree with the, the, the bias. And we don't track what you search for, so we don't know. But I am actually working on a book on the future of science and technology. So my primary use of Google is now actually there. And I've been learning a great deal about medicine and energy and so forth using all of that. Uh, and the, the, what is remarkable to me is the amount of information that's online. If you're motivated, you can literally become an expert after some number of hours. It's extraordinary. All right, well, um, we've got one say, more minute. Uh, yeah, but you, you, you better have the last nice, I was going to say something nice about you again. 
Well, this, uh, please carry on. You, don't <laughs> <laughs> you, go, you go, keep going. No, but I mean, I don't want to, I, I, I want to make sure that you're only here for one hour. And please, afterwards, don't do a, a middle class thing to ask Mr. Schmidt to sign a book or anything bourgeois like that, okay? <laughs> he is here for one hour. I gave him my word. When he finishes, he goes straight through. <laughs> I've got a hip problem, so I'm going to ask Luke to make sure, and the security guard, to escort him off, unless he voluntarily stops for you. Uh, otherwise, please, don't do anything selfie or that ghastly sort of behavior. <laughs> you mentioned, uh, uh, Eric, that every time you go into a lift now, you see half the people using the phone. I mean, I've, I wrote about it, I write about it all the time in my f column, is that now you cannot, even in a restaurant, I know that you will be there if I saw a man switched off with his phone for 90 minutes, but now you go into a restaurant, every single table are now people using the, the, the phone, and, and especially for people who are ardeur, having dinner, and, and they're on their phone, on their, uh, on their iPad, on their whatever it is. Do you think there will ever come a point where people get fatigued and, th and they're not going, uh, and they're going to stop using it and they might get tired? I think this is a cycle that we're going through. We've invented a new toy and this new toy attacks our attention every minute that we're awake. And I don't know about you all, but I'm addicted to it. The moment I wake up, boom, what ha what's going on? What, you know, doing this, doing that, and so forth. Um, and and I, I think a lot of people are like that. And it's very hard to learn. And I think one of the things we'll teach is how to sort of manage that aspect of it. Um, it's called sort of rapid reinforcement learning. And basically, people, people are exploiting the fact that you just like it over and over again. Boom, boom, boom. It raises your serotonin levels. So, All right. so, to, so to me, I sit there and I go, at some point, people are going to say, maybe we forgot a little bit about human contact. My favorite example is using the telephone. Now, I was raised to actually answer the phone. right? And I'm sure you were as well. But Nobody find, phones me. <laughs> uh, and so I, I've actually found that when I call people, and I am actually the executive chairman of the company, you'd think people would answer the phone. They don't. And they don't return the phone. They don't return the phone call. What do you uh, do? They, they, get either, fired. they either ignore you or they email you or something. And if I'm calling you, I actually want to talk to you. I don't want to, I, if I wanted to email you, I would email you. So my point is I think society has to come up with some sort of new rules about this. My proposal is that when people call you, you call them back within 24 hours. It's not a complicated yeah, But what happens situation. if it's somebody you don't like or you detest? Well, then you can send them a note saying, I'm not going to return your call. I can think of a much shorter uh, response in two words. <laughs> <laughs> can you please join there me? There is no one more gracious, humorous, and, <laughs> and entertaining than Sir David Tang. It is a privilege to be here with you, but it's a special privilege to help inaugurate the China Exchange. Well, I'm, I genuflect to your presence here today, and I want to thank you all because you are actually the most important uh, aspect to this exchange. It's an exchange of ideas, and although we didn't talk about China as such, and I apologize for cutting you short, but I really want, wanted to concentrate on technology and there have been so many questions. So for that, I'm going to give you a book uh, in compensation. And uh, in fact, specially, only specially, because I'm exercising my prerogative, I am going to ask Eric just to sign your one copy, <laughs> all right? So that you can't blame him for not taking your question. We're very fair here, but listen, all of you, please use and um, encourage your friends to come because we rely on uh, promotion and we don't have promotion other than word of mouth and we go and ask all these other self-important institutions who always say we don't promote other institutions' uh, uh, activities. But as you can see, what we want to do here is something which is dynamic is erudite, is intelligent, is an intellectual, but at the same time make you enjoy the, the hour. And I hope that uh, you have managed to do that more than most. And I want to thank again Eric for being uh, such a gracious, uh, copiously wonderful 
and um, full of information. And I don't know how he sleeps because he must have more ideas than anybody else. And um, I'm sure that he is thinking about his phone even in his sleep. So um, he's a bionic man. Uh, Eric, thank you very much. And uh, Luke will take you down.